update as of 25th of March 2022. Total persons vaccinated by in the population, the purple bar on the top, fully vaccinated 50.6%. Honorable Minister will go into the breakdown. Number of new positive cases over the last 24 hours, 341. Number of deaths reported during that period, two. And condolences to the families of all of those persons who would have lost loved ones during the pandemic. Total active positive cases now stand at 7,583. Total patients in hospital, 170. Dr. Richards will give the further breakdown on those statistics. Patients by vaccination status from July 22, 2021 to 23rd of March 2022. These are people that would have been hospitalized in either a hospital facility or a step down. 82.4% of those would have been not fully vaccinated. Looking at the last graph on the bottom, total deaths by vaccination status as of 23rd of March 2022. The blue bar, not fully vaccinated, 3,074, 390, again not fully vaccinated. And a small portion, about 6% thereabouts, 258 fully vaccinated. So we'll ask Dr. Hines to go into the EPI update, followed by Dr. Richards. Thank you, CMO. Good afternoon to the Honourable Prime Minister, Honourable Ministers, colleagues, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. The epidemiologic update, utilising the same data point, uh, March 25th, 2022, is as follows. If we look at our now quite familiar epi curve, we see that the bars over to the right-hand side of this curve, the green, blue, and brown or orange, depending on how it looks on your screen, bars representing January, February, and March, respectively, have shown a progressive decline in their heights, representing a progressive decline in the numbers of cases that were presenting and diagnosed on each of the days in each of those months. Rolling average, that dotted line running through the graph, has declined in tandem with the heights of those bars, so we can see that we are having that downward trend that we are hoping to continue. And if you look at that same information at the weekly time scale, we see something similar. Over to the right-hand side where the bars now represent a week's worth of data, January's bars are taller than February, February taller than March, downward trend continuing for about the last five weeks or so. And looking at the background salmon section, which represents positivity, we do see that the positivity, the percentage of individuals coming forward with symptoms being tested for COVID-19 and testing positive has fallen, and that percentage has fallen from somewhere around 76 at its height down to about 32-33% at this point in time. Now, this information is represented in, in a tabular format here where we're looking at the changes from one completed epi week to the next. And the last completed epi week being epi week 11, we see that that ended 20% below the total for epi week 10. Moving to the monthly cases, we see a similar pattern in terms of heights of bars, December into January into February into March, and a pattern that uh, is also representing itself in the salmon section at positivity, having dropped from around 70% in uh, December all the way down to approximately 40% overall for the entire month of March thus far. If we look at the distribution of cases that uh, we've always been uh, describing as the pyramid, the population pyramid for the positives, we see that we have just about 50-50 in the male-female distribution, to be precise, 51.5% female, 48.5% male. And 25 to 49 age group, that active mobile age group, has consistently represented just over half, 51.4% of those who were diagnosed positive. In contrast, when we look at the fatalities, we see a slightly different pattern where the male-female ratio is about 57 or 58% to 42%. And the age group distribution is different, older age groups being more, uh, more frequently represented, those over 60 being about two-thirds of the total uh, population of fatalities. And we also note something that's not visible here. One, that we have a uh, higher incidence of individuals with comorbidities represented among those who are fast. And two, those who were vaccinated were protected. So those who were vaccinated had lower risks of death as opposed to those who were not. And we saw that in the figures that the CMO would have, would have presented. 
And that really brings us to the end of the very brief epidemiologic update. We'll turn you over to Dr. Abdul Richards for the hospital update. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Good afternoon to the Honorable Prime Minister, the Honorable Minister of Health, and the Minister, Honorable Minister of Energy and Energy Industries, and the Office of the Prime Minister. To the health team, good afternoon. Good afternoon to all members of the media and to the viewing list and listening population of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you once again for the opportunity to present some information on the parallel healthcare system. This information is as of 8 a.m. on March 26, 2022, and that is this morning. And I'd like to start with describing the net admissions within the parallel healthcare system. Net admissions refer to the actual excess number of patients on a daily basis. And you would notice from January 23rd, uh, that's the area where you would see the green and orange dots actually converging, that, and that represents a decrease in the net admission of patients. That was a good and a positive sign because it meant that the burden on the parallel healthcare system was decreasing. That is, there were less and less patients requiring care within the parallel healthcare system. I'd like to just show you and refer back to mid-November where you would have seen that gap actually widening. And that demonstrates the situation between mid-November into early January. And that wide gap is in stark contrast to the tightening gap and the narrow gap that we would have noticed coming from January 23rd to present, which is just over two months now. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, the parallel healthcare system has now seen less patients on a daily basis being admitted for medical treatment and that can be translated into a progressively decreasing burden on the system. Indeed, a positive and a reassuring sign. And this graph and slide just demonstrates the impact on a weekly basis. And you would notice that from about week three, the blue bars show basically a low, very low number of patients who are in excess or excessive, excess admissions into the system. From November to early January 2022, we would have noticed that over 100 extra patients were being added into the system. And so the burden was high. So yet again, a positive trend that has been noted from, the, from, the, from February, the end of January to present. Now I'll focus on the actual number of patients within the system. And this morning, in our hospitals, there are 173 patients and zero patients in our step down. And for the first time since April of last year, we have zero patients in step down facilities. And this trend has been consistent over the past 10 days or so. Our step downs are in actuality empty. If we look at the overall number of patients, and that's a green line, we would look at, we, I would like to draw your attention to that peak. And that, on that date, the hospital occupancy was 84%. And that is the highest hospital occupancy that we would have ever recorded in the parallel healthcare system, in spite of us adding hospitals. On that day, there were 755 patients in hospital requiring high acuity and medium acuity care, that is, severely and critically ill patients. And the impact of that, or the, the, if, we, if we looked at the trend, in contrast to today where there are 173 patients. And of course, this graph demonstrates a similar trend, which is a significant downward and declining trend. We also look at the number of patients in each of the high acuity hospitals. And in these high acuity hospitals, we've noticed again that from over the last five weeks, six weeks, I'm sorry, over the last six weeks, all our hospitals are under that 75% warning zone that we would have looked at. Again, this trend has not been seen for almost one year. 
it means that our hospitals that require significant resources that we would have spoken about are half empty or less empty. The Coover Medical and Multi-Training Facility, which manages our severely and critically ill patients, is actually at 23% occupancy this morning. So only two out of 10 beds at that hospital are currently occupied. By level of care, you would have heard us speak consistently about the ICU levels of care and the demand for intensive care unit beds in our hospitals and in the accident and emergency departments. Today, I am pleased to report that the ICU occupancy is 26%. That is 21 out of 80 beds in the system are currently filled. In the accident and emergency department, there are no patients requiring ICU care. The overall occupancy is 22%. That is the 173 patients. So we've moved from a situation in December where eight out of 10 beds were filled to now two out of 10 beds being filled. We have also paid emphasis on the accident and emergency departments. Those are 10 a &E departments across Trinidad and Tobago that patients will first be admitted to, examined, and then transferred. Again, on December 15th, a maximum of 215 patients. And on December 23rd, that day of 84% occupancy, there were 168 patients. Today, we are noticing 28, 28 patients with a consistent decline from the mid to late January period. The ambulance indices as well, only 11% of the overall ambulance system is currently being dedicated and being used for COVID-19 transport systems. The reality, ladies and gentlemen, is that the, the situation in the parallel healthcare system is in stark contrast at this point as compared to November to December. On one day to November, we were managing 923 patients across the 16 facilities in the system and the 10 accident and emergency departments. On that date, we recall that there was one ICU bed left in the country, and we were trying our utmost best to ensure that all patients received the standard of care required for COVID-19. Today, we have 173 patients across our hospitals, zero patients in our step-down facilities, and 28 patients in our 10 accident and emergency departments. The reality, ladies and gentlemen, yet again, is that we are in a much more positive situation and a re reassuring circumstances as compared to last year, between October 17th and January 22nd or so. However, we must be aware that the COVID-19 virus is still with us. And in this regard, let us please continue to practice all proven measures. Let us seek medical attention early with the approved Ministry of Health guidelines, continue to practice the three W's, and let us please take the opportunity to be vaccinated. Thank you once again to the viewing and listening population. And on behalf of the health team, thank you for your continued support. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. I'd like to ask Dr. Trotman to give us a brief overview on the clinical challenges as they appear at this time at the hospital that she oversees the clinical story. Honorable Prime Minister, ministers, members of all the healthcare institutions of Trinidad and Tobago, members of the listening and viewing public. As Dr. Richards and Dr. Hines and the CMO, Dr. Pasram, would have painted the picture. It is indeed a situation where we are seeing less patients, but, and that's a big but, those patients still represent and reflect mainly unvaccinated patients. The thrust of what I would like to say today is we continue to see patients who are ill with COVID-19 who are unvaccinated and to urge and encourage those to please get vaccinated. Even when vaccinated, wear your mask, distance and wash your hands. Patients who are coming into the hospital are those who are ill enough because they need support, whether it be oxygen, 
antibiotics, etc., that has to be provided within the hospital setting. And so those patients are seeking medical care. Of note is those patients are still coming relatively late. So if it is that you are ill, you should present yourself to be investigated. We also urge you to continue to make sure that your underlying health situation in, is in as the best situation as possible. So if you're hypertensive, if you're diabetic, take your medications because not only are you at a bigger risk, but during your illness, you tend to get out of control. Those patients in, on the medical ward, thankfully, we are able to see them and discharge three to five days. Those in the ICU, five, seven, sometimes 10 days and longer. But we are seeing patients, less patients, less patients, less patients fortunately, dying. Overall, we are seeing less patients, but there are still patients within the system. We are urging you to continue to vaccinate, encourage someone that you know to vaccinate, to practice your three W's at all times. We've had a lot of instruction and I thank all because as a team and as a group, we are here in this situation because of everyone's cooperation. We couldn't do it without those who would have been vaccinated. We couldn't do it without those who were washing their hands, wearing their masks, and watching your distance. We want you to continue to do that, even more so than normal, because with this particular strain, you may be infected and not know, and you can still transmit. Please, practice your three Ws, and vaccinate, and take your booster when it's indicated. I thank you. Thank you very much, Drs. Hines, Parsram, Richards, and Trotman. Fellow citizens, we are at this time just about two years into the pandemic of the 21st century. There are some undisputed facts. Fact number one is that we are still in that pandemic. Fact number two, this time at mid-March of 2022, we have been fighting this threat, winning most of the wars, losing some for two years. I want to say to the population that we are in a much better place today than we were at Christmas last year. As Prime Minister of this country, I, like the doctors and nurses, spent many nights a week wondering what daybreak will bring and what the next day would bring. Because there were times during this pandemic where the mutation was such that human beings were not sure what our survival rate and ratio would have been. And notwithstanding many who would look backwards as though it was nothing, we were on the brink on more than one occasion. I remember December 23rd last year, when the projections and the curves showed that we would be accelerating upwards to possibly 100 or more persons dying per day. Those are the projections. Thankfully, the nature of the virus that it turned out to be, while it was infecting more people, the strength at which it infected them and the causes of illness was significantly reduced. We had that information coming to us from South Africa early when the Omicron was identified. But we had no guarantee that that virus in our population would have caused the population to experience a reduction in the level of illness. Not an elimination, as Dr. Trotman has just confirmed, but a reduction, a significant reduction. So, it being such where late December, we were at the stage where, as the doctor just told us, we had one 
I see bed left. And I did say to you, people of Trinidad and Tobago, that if you got sick soon after that, and we maintain that situation, we were at the stage where people requiring intensive care would have been in the corridors of our hospitals and the driveways of our properties. That is where we were. Sometime later on, we had death rates of 25, 28, 30 persons per day. Today, it must be a relief to the population, especially the praying population, among which I count myself, that the report today is as it is, that we've had two deaths, two. two. We couldn't have predicted this in December. And I must tell the population again, the preparations that we were making in December into early January, where we were saying that if this is what we are facing and the way out of it is mandatory vaccination, I was prepared, as I indicated, to put mandatory vaccination upon this population in an attempt to preserve lives. We were there. The legislation was being prepared, and just as we were concluding, we were observing, but we were seeing good things. By late January, what we were seeing was a reduction in the intensity, and even though we were having days of high infection levels, we were seeing a reduction in the requirement for hospital care. Because from day one, we always maintained that our success or failure in handling this pandemic will depend on whether we are able to provide adequate hospital care to those persons who need it. And for those persons who didn't get vaccinated and who gambled with a chance and can say, no, I, I told you so, we didn't need it. All I will say is that don't push your luck. It is still the era of the pandemic. We in Trinidad and Tobago today can say that our circumstances are considerably improved. But we are not in a position to say that the pandemic is over or that the infection threat is endemic and we can now go on and ignore COVID-19 and its variants. What can we say? We can say that there were times in the early part of this experience, this two-year experience, that our fears were real and the threats were of great danger and that we did lose a number of lives in the pandemic. In attempting to prevent that from happening, we made some very drastic moves at great cost to the population. We, one time we shut the economy down completely. We asked people to stay at home we put instructions in place that you couldn't go to church. We shut our schools down. And these were all the things we did to ensure that the number of people who would have succumbed to death, to this virus, was minimal, if not eliminated completely. A significant number of our elderly population fell prey. A, sig a significant number of our not so elderly population. But thankfully, our children escaped the worst of it. Given what we have done along the way, in that we had to preserve lives and livelihoods, we are now in a position to say that the preservation of life seems to be something that we can take credit for. And we need to do more on the side of the equation of preserving livelihoods. There were some aspects of our livelihood that we never shut down. I'm sure you would remember we never shut down the essential services. Never. We never shut down the energy sector. Never. We had to take the risk of keeping them open because we had to have water. We felt we had to have electricity and we had to have the earnings from the energy sector. We kept them open throughout this pandemic, and we did so successfully, and we can take credit for that. Soon as it was possible to have a reasonable risk level in the country, we reopened our manufacturing sector. And while we kept the public service 
at home for significant periods, we very carefully and cautiously reopened the public service. And only not too long ago, we indicated that all public servants ought to come back out like normal. So step by step, keeping our eyes on the level of risk involved, the nature of the virus, the story from the hospitals, tell you the best story you've got in the virus and its threat of the pandemic of 2022 was given to us by Dr. Richards today, which is that our hospitals are in fact far from overflowing with patients. We are a long way from that last bed. We are a long way from the corridors being the place where patients would be. And our reports of persons who have died from the virus are significantly improved as contrasted with where we were only December. It is now March. And as a result of the improvements in our circumstance, the first thing that I would like to do today is once again to thank and congratulate all the leadership in the health sector, starting with the minister, the CMO, the doctors, the nurses, the ambulance drivers, all the support staff, all those people in the health sector for whom this was your challenge and you rose to the occasion. I just want to mention one thing. In the political arena, I was driven to appoint a committee of five people, I think it was, yes. not too long ago, because at the peak of the spike, it was being said that those deaths were as a result of the incompetence of our professional staff at the hospitals. And we need to confirm that and to change them. I could tell the population today, those experts found no support for that. In fact, as I told the Parliament when the report came in, what they were able to report was that international best practice as approved by WHO was what prevailed in the hospital environment and similar in Trinidad and Tobago. We took comfort in that. Certain recommendations were made largely about improving um, comfort and care of the staff, and we took those recommendations on board. But respect, but, but with respect, triage, and clinical management of our patients in our hospitals, there was absolutely no shortcoming from those who had committed themselves to the Hippocratic Oath. And we as a people should be proud. I could tell you, last year, very early in the dangerous phase of the pandemic, the most dangerous phase, I should say, in talking to hospitals and professionals abroad and comparing notes with them, I was asked on more than one occasion when I reported the nature and quality of the staff that we had in Trinidad and Tobago and where they were located in our health system. And frequently I was asked the question, where did you find those people? And I with pride told them, they were already within the health system of Trinidad and Tobago. All the way up to gene sequencing at UWI, this country rose to the occasion in this pandemic. And while the pandemic is not yet over, we can begin to think that it might be over soon, and we can look back at this period when we were threatened by our very lives being lost, and what some people would have called the worst health system in the world, the worst health caregivers in the world, the collapsed health system in the world, it came to our rescue. And today, I can tell you in international journals, where it is being written, and where the boxes can be ticked as to where we were and what was required of a nation, you will find that Trinidad and Tobago has a high passing grade with respect to how we manage COVID-19 and continue so to do. But ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are still in a pandemic. But the response now that is required is not the same response that was required in the middle of last year, September last year, or December of last year. Thankfully, the response that is required now is one that we could say, while we are still required to keep washing our hands, 
as we were taught in primary school many, many years ago, to keep away from mixing with large crowds if we can avoid it, to get vaccinated so as to induce some immunity. All those requirements in cognizance of the fact that there's a virus that can spread from person to person. We wear that mask and we are doing what is required. And today, I can tell you I met with the health team as I promised. On Tuesday night, I did say I was going to meet with our team. We did meet yesterday. We had a very detailed meeting. And today, we're in a position to report to you that given the nature of our experience, given what we know of the dominant variant, given what we know of how the population is responding from a clinical standpoint, given what we know about our hospital preparations and infrastructural arrangements in place, we will, as of today, remove much of what we had in place when we were dealing with a more threatening environment in the COVID, in the pandemic of 2020 and 2021, 22. So, as of, as of tomorrow, and with respect to the requirement for having a person coming into our country and having to have only a PCR test, as of tomorrow, we'll accept an antigen test, which can be had very easily, very quickly, just to ensure that if persons are determined by the test that you are sick, that we can handle you a little differently because the danger of an infected person on Omicron is not as severe as it was with Delta, as Delta was raging. So that is one change that we'd make. We will still require that your status be known and that you respond according to your status. But the absolute requirement for a negative PCR before you can come into the country, that would be changed. The Attorney General will make the necessary arrangement. And of course, the, the travel pass um, would remain for a little while just to make sure we can manage that. I anticipate that very soon we would be able to lift this as well. Most importantly, when we were in the middle of uh, high levels of risk and we thought how could we have some livelihood while pre pre pres preserving life, we came up with a system of minimizing exposures of persons and determining who was vaccinated and who was not. We are in a position now to do away with all of that. We can do away with the safe zone operations and we will be required now to continue, continue to wear the face mask in a public place except if you are on a sporting field, if you are in an environment where you are engaging in physical sporting activity, that would be optional but there's not, there would not be a legal requirement to have your mask on, but in, uh, other than that, in a public place, like in public transport or in the public place, for the time being, we'll continue to keep the mask on and we will remove the requirements, all restrictions that existed on going to rivers and beaches and so on, they'll be removed completely. And that will come into effect on the 4th of April, that's Monday coming. Monday the 4th, Monday the 4th, which means that we give, we give you time to prepare to be completely uh, free. And we don't mean by free there to go and be um, reckless. Trinidad and Tobago is moving very quickly to a situation where the COVID restrictions in totality will be removed. So the antigen test arrangements will come into effect tomorrow yes. and the other um, that, that's, that's easy to do administratively but the other things that we are removing all other restrictions 
meaning that vaccinated and unvaccinated people and safe zone arrangements, all of that will go. And we now, as a population of 1.3 or 4 million, we are operating on the basis that we did vaccinate what, seven, seven and a half, hundred thousand? 708,000 people in this country were fully vaccinated. And there were a few who took one shot and didn't come back. But of course, there were those who didn't come at all. And there were many people who were naturally infected and only discovered they had the virus if they, had to, if they had to have a test. And many people who didn't have a test, they got natural immunity by being exposed. And we anticipate that that would be in the order of about 300,000 people or thereabouts. So we could say that in our population, there are about a million people who would have been exposed to the virus in a way that their body would have responded. So we are a different population today than the population that existed in March 20. 20. Completely different. And that is why we could now take these, uh, I, I, would, I don't want to say risk, and I don't want to say liberties. We can uh, take these appreciations of not being restricted by the actions that we took to respond when we were a different population and when the viral variant was different and far more dangerous. So, we will put out a complete list of what, in fact, what we'll do is simply say what is required to be done. And if you didn't hear it as something to be done, then you know what was there before would have gone, right? And there's no limit to public gatherings. You may recall there was a time when there were five people. I, I myself experienced having to go to my brother's funeral and there were only was it five people allowed in the church? And later on, there were 10 people and then 25 people. Today, that restriction is completely removed. Right? And it would give, and that's from the 4th of April, eh? from the 4th of April. So we, what is in place now stays in place until that weekend, and we start with that. So you can prepare to do that, and now you know it's going to happen, and we expect that. We will behave responsibly because I must tell you, even as we are doing this now, coming from where we came from, there are one or two countries now that are experiencing severe outbreaks of COVID-19 and are required to respond. And there are also mutations still taking place with COVID-19 variants. Fortunately, so far, none of them have posed a threat to negatively change where we're at. But given the biology of these things, it is not impossible that there could be a mutant sometime in the not too distant future, which could change all of this. But after two years, we are no longer strangers to this virus, and we are no longer uh, neophytes with respect to how the country would have to manage in a situation where a virus could be killing thousands of people. One of the most difficult experiences we had in the two-year period is the closure of schools. And I want at this time to thank the Minister of Education for doing human service in working with the stakeholders in the education system to find possibilities. Not everybody saw those possibilities because there are people who are still saying that the school should never have been opened. But we always wanted to get our children back to school relatively safely at the earliest opportunity. And we did so with some of our secondary school children. Our exams were done. Our exam schedules were kept. And many teachers went beyond the call of duty. Not all of them but enough to ensure that the education system delivered to those for whom the system was structured. Teachers exist to teach students, and parents have responsibilities to ensure that their progeny are educated in the school system. While there were significant difficulties in keeping our schools open, once again, we can look back and say we carefully and cautiously opened the doors, brought out the numbers, encouraged our children to be vaccinated. Many of them, I think, what, 60,000 children were vaccinated? 
and that allowed the unvaccinated ones also to have an opportunity because the more vaccinated persons you had, the easier it made life for the unvaccinated. It wasn't that we were separating people. It was trying to reduce the effect that the virus could have had on the overall population. And today, I simply want to say that the level of responsibility that we place on the individuals in this country remain. And now that we are opening up as we are doing, now more than ever, it is an individual responsibility. There were times when the state intervened and said to you, stay in your home. We're not doing that now. There were times when we said to you, in your car, doesn't matter who is in your car, wear a mask. We're not doing that now. There were times when we said to you, if you were live, making a living, plying a taxi, you could only carry half of the passengers. We're not doing that now. We are well away from that and leaving you with the responsibility of not forgetting that the virus is still out there and you are still required not to infect yourself with dirty hands, not to go without a mask if you are among people out in a public place, not to go too close and get into an environment unnecessarily if you believe that that environment could be infectious. And of course, we are going to bring our children out to school in April and the minister will speak on this next week. And that is the last major hurdle that we have. And we're getting close to some semblance of normalcy. It was something that has rested on my shoulder and my mind all the time. And when we get those children out to school, when I see them in their uniforms back out to school, I would know that we are almost there. I want to say today that many people in very different places contributed to where we are. Not everybody felt that we could have survived or that we were doing enough or doing well enough. But I think enough people in the country acted responsibly so that all of us in the end could be where we are today. But there's one group of people who must stand out. And I come back to those people in the health sector who had the responsibility for planning and executing our response to COVID. And I think the time must come and will come soon when the people of Trinidad and Tobago would make a special acknowledgement to those people in the health sector who would have played this very significant role in these dark days that we have experienced in the last two years. And when we do that, I simply want to say to the rest of us, whether you were in the cabinet, whether you were in the essential services, whether you were in the energy sector, it would not be good form to say, well, I too contributed, so therefore I too must get something. All I'm asking you to do is to acknowledge the unique role that the health sector played, and it behoves us to acknowledge them separate and apart from the rest of us. And very soon, this matter will go before the cabinet, and we will say to the country, and ask the country to join us in thanking, even as they continue to provide us with that care and attention as the pandemic continues across the world. We look forward to the day when the WHO will see it fit to say to all of us worldwide that it is no longer a pandemic and we are into a different phase. That would be a joyous day. And I tell this country that the day WHO says that to us, there will be a great thanksgiving in Trinidad and Tobago. When that will be, we don't know. But these are the plans that we will make as a grateful people under God, as it says in our constitution. So if you have any questions, we will take them now. Uh, you mentioned, General from the D'Souza from Music, you mentioned schools reopening in April. Um, we see we could possibly have a gift of 40,000 vaccines for the 5 to 11. Um, are we still with seeing that a relatively, relatively small number of um, the teens and preteens have actually accepted the vaccines, what would be the next thing going on? Well, we have, what we are doing 
We expect to be in a position to have vaccines for adults and for children on call. If you require to be vaccinated, the public health system should be able to vaccinate you. I did say early on that if we had got to the point where to save our children's lives in the country, it would have been required to make children vaccines mandatory. I was prepared to do that. Just add it to the list of other vaccines. Fortunately, it has not come to that. But vaccination for children is still recommended. And for those parents who would like to have their children vaccinated, we expect to have vaccines to provide that service. That gift from Spain is welcome because those vaccines are very expensive. And we will use them up. And if we see that there's a demand from the parents for those children and those 40,000 are used up, we will then, the, the Ministry has already been instructed to be in a position to access more for greater usage if that is the uh, position of the parents. So we will offer vaccines. Even as we speak today, you would have heard the doctor saying to you, get boosted, get vaccinated. These are the personal decisions that you are required to keep making. In terms of the unvaccinated coming into the country, would this still need to be uh, a state supervised quarantine as well? Unvaccinated nationals? Nationals. Uh, well, un uh, sorry, unvaccinated for foreigners and so on. No, for the moment, the unvaccinated foreigners will stay where they are, as far as Trinidad and Tobago is concerned. For the moment, we'll maintain that system. We don't want to invite trouble if we could avoid it. Right? But for the moment, what is in place with respect to unvaccinated non-nationals, but we anticipate that sometime in the not too distant future, given what is happening with respect to the biology of the virus and the clinical stories, that we may be able to remove that and all. So um, we just don't want to overdo it and then regret what we have done. So we will continue to be cautious, but effective. Mr. Prime Minister, good afternoon to you, Urvashi from TV. As a graduate, I mean, you spoke about children being able to go to school without being vaccinated. Has the ministry, has the government reached a position on unvaccinated athletes? As it stands, unvaccinated athletes, if I'm not mistaken, cannot play on the national team or cannot participate in sports. Will you seek to open that up a bit? Well, that once we go to a position where we are not segregating vaccinated from unvaccinated, it means that people will be allowed to operate as though there is no restriction. But there's a lot of restriction internationally where to participate in certain kinds of international competition, the requirement is still there. That's a requirement that we can't change. So that, that's where we're at. But we are on a road to getting sometime in the not too distant future to a point where being vaccinated or not being vaccinated is not the story. The story is whether we are being health conscious enough to ensure that we don't have to call on Dr. Richards for a bed. Prime Minister, this thing from the Trinidad and Guyan. I'm not sure if this is a question for, sorry, for your medical team, but is there, um, we've seen some countries that have lifted their restrictions and then they've had to reimpose them because of these spikes. Is there a, a, a time frame or a limit at which the medical team will be looking at how we're going to react to the responses and then see if we can possibly be another lockdown? Well, Dr. Parsam, come and take that question, but let me just, while he's getting to the mic, let me say something. We will continue to observe this virus on a daily or hourly basis. And what we're going to do is to respond to it on the basis of the threat it poses at the time it poses that threat. Continue. So, so it's continuous monitoring. As, as you know, we have, we monitor 24 hours a day. Um, so continuous monitoring is needed to be continued as before. Generally, ten, generally, as you would know, you tend to see if you have changing in, in, in the movement of people, you tend to see at least 14 to 21 days to see some sort of at least a national change in the numbers, in the hospitalization, those kinds of things. To those Over the two years, you, you have seen 14 to 21 days being sort of a benchmark where you could look and see changes occurring. So 
certainly within that time of type of time frame, you'll be a little extra vigilant to see what is happening, but it's a continuous monitoring process. It is very uncertain. I think if one thing COVID has taught us, taught us over the last two years is that everything is uncertain, um, but we have to be very vigilant. Our surveillance system has to be robust and be able to adapt to changes very quickly, and then, of course, inform the rest of the health response. So, more or less, hopefully that answer answers that bit. Uh, um, Renuka, thank you for asking that question because it allows me to say, now that we are responding today to our condition today, don't come back in a month's time or two months or six months. If the circumstances change drastically and say, well, you say that you could open up and look what, you happen, what happened now. I have no crystal ball on this virus. I'm simply going with the data today, the projections we make going forward, and none of us know what could happen in the future, the distant or the not too distant future. If for any reason our country ends up like the country you might have mentioned, which have had to go back, because a number of countries have had to go back, what it would have meant is that the situation would have changed and the sensible response would have been to do differently to what we are doing today. And if, God forbid, that happens to us, it would be folly to say, well, we did open up and now the door can't close. We will respond to the virus responsibly depending on the nature of the threat it poses to the population. And that is why we are still requiring certain restrictions. And we are still asking for a certain responsible individual behavior so as not to create the opportunity. Because we believe once we do what we know works, which is wear the mask for a while longer, wash the hand, use sanitizer, and of course, mixing but with some certain amount of responsibility right? if we do those things we reduce the chances of us going back to a situation which require more rigorous negative action I was in London a few weeks ago and Minister Young and our team we were the only people in, in London wearing a mask everybody else was out in the street and as soon as we got back here within a week of being back here the government had to reinstitute the wearing of masks in a public place. So we will, if it happens here in Trinidad and Tobago, please don't come and say that we misled you. It is how the virus reacts to the population, vice versa, and that is what we are going to require, be required to respond to. And we are hoping that we do not come to a situation where we have to roll back these privileges and freedoms that we are giving ourselves now. And we have seen changes, positive changes, this, this report that we're giving you today is the best report that we have given you in two years. And we're just keeping our fingers crossed that we can continue to give you that kind of report going forward. But we have no guarantees because I do not have a crystal ball. Mr. President, you did mention uh, entry requirements, one, and that we, we will be doing away with the safe zones. But you didn't mention nightclubs, parties, fashion playing of music in public, consumption of alcohol in the public. Do we have the license to fact? We, <laughs> we have no restrictions. We, we have removed the restrictions. And from the 4th of April, you would be required to control yourself. Right? <laughs> you will be required to control yourself from the 4th of April. That is what the circumstances allow us to do. Eh? So the government will not be out there with policemen saying, turn off the music, get out the party. We are, and that would be a huge normalization. And, and we expect that people will socialize as you are socializing. On the way to a public place, you'll be required to wear your mask. We have not restricted the number of you who can meet together. So, and that's why we're saying, by removing the number of you who can meet together, if 25 of you or 40 of you meet, there's nobody counting anymore. But you do know that there is a virus out there. There's nobody in this country who can pretend not to know. And some of you have taken the position that I will not get vaccinated. We've left that with you. We've encouraged you, we've pushed you, we've even threatened you. 
we are at the stage now we're saying, okay, you do know. You do know. And we're not telling you, don't party, don't have a beer, don't go to a bar. We've passed that stage. We're into another stage now. And that's why the personal responsibility cannot be overstated. Because the government is no longer playing that rule of restricting what you do, except in very few instances. As it relates to the reopening of schools, do you envision that it will be full school for all students? Do you still envision a rotation? There, there is a model that the ministry will make known on um, early next week, and I would, I would rather leave that to the minister to speak to parents in particular and the rest of us when the ministry speaks about it. I don't want to piecemeal deal with it today. Exactly. But the minister is coming next week with that. You know, we keep on hearing that there's so much we learned from the pandemic. Is there any consideration for traffic, at least? I mean, when school is back out, we would expect the traffic to increase exponentially, just as exponentially, and so on. That's all part of the normal living. Uh, we expect that there'll be more people out there. And what we're saying now is that we are anticipating life with more people, without restrictions. Right? It, it will not be normal because it is not going to be normal until you are able to ignore the threat of the virus. Normalcy will not return until you are, we are in a position to, to say, well, the pandemic is behind us and therefore there's nothing to worry about because we will have to be doing certain responsive things. Right? And as we remove those restrictions, that's when the normalcy will appear. But we had public transport, even private trans um, buses and taxis, 50%, 75%, and 100% now. How much more normal can that be? And of course, the people who live by plying that trade, they were suffering when those restrictions took place. To get back to a point now where they are moving with normal numbers, there's normalcy for them. But people in public transport would be required to wear a mask for a bit longer. So it, it's, it's, it's approaching normalcy, but it's not yet normal. And it will not be normal as long as the virus is there requiring some element of response from us. With the improvement of the situation of the country, um, has there been a decision in recommissioning of or even other hospitals as well as um, will there be a discontinuation of COVID relief grants? I would like the minister to answer to that because the, question, the answer is yes, but give some details. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. Um, thanks for the question. Yes. So, as you know, the, we started the process of decommissioning COVID hospitals. Um, point 14 has been returned. We are starting the decommissioning of the Arima General Hospital next week. We will be following the same model which worked very well with um, that we developed at point 14. That is, at the first stage, we stopped admitting new patients. So no new patients will be admitted from Monday. And then what happens is that you discharge persons as they get well. Um, I can't give you a firm date, but at the outside, it should take about a month to two months to, um, for normal attrition as people get well to go home. Um, we have also decommissioned the Takarigua Racket Center as a step-down facility. It was used originally to house those persons from Barbados, if you remember those, those days. It seems so far, so far away. Then it was used as a mass vaccination site, then as a step-down facility. So I really want to thank Sport TT and the Ministry of Sport. Um, everything is being dismantled and taken out as we speak. We hope that process to be finished in about two weeks, then we have to clean and so on. So that is on the way out. Also on the way out is the Debe step-down facility, also on the way out. We will maintain for the time being as a national step-down facility in case we need it, the UTT in uh, Spring Village, Val Valsane. So UTT will be the national step-down facility as we need it. Uh, we will also maintain the St. James Hospital. Um, we, are, we will be dismounting and uh, packing up the 
field hospital that is at Jean Pierre complex right now. Um, in case we need it in future, the plan is to, to remount it at Coover, if we need it. But right now, both field hospitals are empty and have been empty for a while. So that's the decommissioning phase that we are in. Thank you. When these hospitals are decommissioned, when they are up back in, in, in full running, uh, if, the, if the need arises to recommission it basically as a COVID hospital, how soon can, I, can that happen? Right. So I would have taken a note to Cabinet about two weeks ago on this matter. Um, the title of the note was From Pandemic to End Endemic Stage. The medium to long term plan is to treat COVID 19 in the public health care system in the same way we treat N1, H1N1, with dedicated sites within the normal healthcare system. So unless something dramatic happens, there is no plan at this point in time to take back these facilities and use them exclusively for COVID, right? Um, so we are making those arrangements. And finally, for me, the gift from Spain, any update on, in, on that in terms of uh, when that is coming? Yeah, thanks. So I did speak again to His Excellency uh, yesterday. Uh, we are making the arrangements. We have no firm date as yet. As soon as we have a date, you know, we will come to you because I understand there are some parents who really want to get those uh, that age cohort vaccinated, for which we are grateful. Well, if we are able to move away from the COVID front at 20 to 4, then we can have a shorter press conference than we normally would. If there are no further questions, if, if you have other questions, we take them now. Yes. Uh, Prime Minister, I'm sure you would have seen by now the Vice President of Guyana, Barak Ragdew, has made some comments about the Trinidad and Tobago economy. And he doubled down on it earlier today, just saying that he's using it as almost like a guidepost for Guyana not to fall. Have, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? There are a lot of people in Guyana, and I'm not really distracted by uh, Vice President Jack Dew's comments about us. A lot of people comment about us, some favorably and some not. We will not be distracted by that. Mr. Prime Minister, in, in that same vein, you would have made some comments in Parliament earlier this week to... Uh, MP for Napoli, if you want to go Guyana, why don't you go Guyana? Did you mean in any way to be negative towards those countries, Guyana or Barbados? The English language is very simple and straightforward for those of us who use it as a mother tongue. I was speaking about Rodney Charles of Trinidad and Tobago and where he wants to go. That had nothing to do with Guyana because Rodney Charles goes to places that have none to do with Guyana. Let me tell, tell you why. I, 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 I must admit eh, that I did lose my cool at that moment. Because when Rodney Charles comes and plays advisor to me and to Trinidad and Tobago, it, 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 it rots my gut. Because I tell you why. Rodney Charles, that same Rodney Charles, he was representing us in New York as a diplomat at the United Nations. There's a racist political party in France called the Nationalist Party, run by Jean-Marie Le Pen. He died. His daughter took over that party, Marine Le Pen. There was, a, there was a presidential election in France, and in attempting to push her candidacy, she traveled to New York, hoping to raise her profile by talking to diplomats and leaders in New York. She was not even so offensive was that campaign and the persons associated with it. She was not even able to get the French diplomats in New York to host her because the French people did not want to associate with the nature of that campaign. She was not able to meet with a single diplomat in New York except Rodney Charles of Trinidad and Tobago, who agreed to have lunch with her. I found that to be offensive. I continue to find Rodney Charles 
a person to apologize to the people of Trinidad and Tobago who sold out our public image for a plate of food and to come now in the parliament behaving the way he is behaving and seeking to stoke division between Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana and Barbados and whoever else, it is just provoking. Because he owes this country an apology and I will tell you something talking to me about being friendly with Granger and that is the reason why I am not associating with the politics of Guyana unlike some of them we are not interfering in the politics of any country I came back here from a long tiring trip to Ghana I got into my bed at 2 o'clock in the morning and I got up at 4 o'clock got to the airport joined my colleague from Barbados and we went to Guyana and we spent three days in Guyana seeking to part the population that was going at each other's throats around an election result. And I want to say something to the people of Guyana and the people of Trinidad and Tobago now because of what Rodney Charles said in our parliament. Rodney Charles is a parliamentarian in this country and he threw out in our parliament that I as Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, I am not friendly with the government of Guyana because I hold some friendliness with the outgoing government and the president of Guyana. I act respectfully and cooperatively with every CARICOM head. Every one of them I regard as my colleague and the record would show I chaired CARICOM and some of the most far-reaching consequences had to be dealt with during my stewardship. And I went to Ghana that morning, and I could say to the people of the Caribbean, now contrary to what Rodney Charles and the UNC is trying to stoke in this country, there was one thing I said to my colleague at the time, who was the prime president of Ghana, I said, if you have lost this election, lose it with dignity. There'll be another chance. But if there's no dignity in this defeat, the next time you and your party will be of no use to your country. And that was the position of Trinidad and Tobago in Guyana. So when Rodney Charles gets up now and make that kind of statement to mislead the people of Trinidad and Tobago and of Guyana and of CARICOM, I take serious offense. But he represents the UNC. That is a clear and pleasant threat to good order in Trinidad and Tobago. But I will not engage in any to in and fro in except to say a lot of people have spoken about us Thankfully, most of them speak well of us. I just have one more thing. So, the reporting to the blackout, the nationwide blackout, sorry, island wide blackout of February, you, the month is up that it was supposed to have been delivered to you. Is it something that you've had sight of as yet? I haven't seen that report yet, and I'm sure that they're working on it, and we will get that report. And any of these reports, as soon as they come to us, we let the population know and we share the contents with them. We have no, there's nothing that we have to hide from this population. As soon as any of those reports come in, as we did with the health report, we make it known and the population is better off once you know what it is. But of course there are those who believe that these reports are something to protect the government. No, no that's, not, that's not so at all. We too are anxious to get the details of what actually happened and to get the recommendations to improve our circumstances. As it relates to the Russian-Ukraine war and its impact on trade internationally, have you had any projections on our supplies um, for basic items like flour, cooking oil, and so on? And has it been of any concern to you? Not more than you would have had because the people who are handling that, they spoke publicly. Um, uh, we, we are looking at the um, source and um, the international market for products that we sell and that we buy. It's not the best market to be in at this time. Um, it appears as though there could be shortages, so we have to prepare ourselves. Um, recently, I saw the head of the Supermarket Association giving a very detailed um, and, and uh, educational discourse as to what components of our diets would be affected by the availability or lack thereof. And when it's available, the price at which those products, because externally, the price of a lot of our 
common food items, the price is forced up by these external circumstances, not the least of which is the war in Europe. I, I, I never thought that I would have been seeing a war in Europe in my lifetime. I'm seeing one going on continuously. And we are an importing nation where unfortunately, unfortunately, we import a lot of our diet by choice. The nature of our diet, we believe that an apple is better than a pom city. We believe that flour is better than breadfruit. I remember when I just became prime minister, I mentioned that we should consume more cassava. And I was wrongly criticized by some people. I, I don't know why someone thought that that was something that I should not have said. Because, you know, if you go to the back of the Prime Minister's residence, there's cassava there, planted there by me. Right? The largest bunch of silk fig I've seen, and I grew up with silk fig, the largest bunch I've ever seen was in a tree at the back there that I planted. I still have peas in my fridge from my peas crop at the back of the yard. And what I'm saying is this. We can do some more here. And we should, and we must, and the government's policy is that we should. Because availability and price may be, may be beyond our control. And there's no, it's not going to change by saying the government this and the government that. Some of these things are well beyond the reach or the influence of the government. The oils and fats and flour and grain and animal feed. Right? You eat a lot of chicken. But the chicken that we eat here, they raise an imported feed. So these are the links we need to know. And those people who misinform the population, they don't help you. you know. they, they put you in a position to want to blame somebody. But you'd be better off if you understand it. Then you might know that there are some things that you might be able to do to ameliorate the effects of these things upon you and your family. And I would like to encourage the population to pay attention to the outside world because we are in that outside world as purchasers of their products. Thank you very much for coming and I want to say that the media, I thanked everybody, but I want to thank the media for the work that you've done for the two-year period. Most of the times you've got it right, all the time you've communicated with the public and a well-informed public is a public that is better able to perform well during a pandemic. Thank you all very much for staying the course. Thank you. Thank you.